Foundation. I would like to thank the Foundation for having my organization here to convey our idea for this conference. And this is happening at a very good time. It's a good time because universal jurisdiction has some setbacks, as here in Spain, we all know that. But they're also making progress. There are some European states, such as Spain or France, that have clearly reduced over the recent years the scope of the principle of uh, universal jurisdiction. And as I say, there are very different positive effects. It would seem that there are many states that are adopting universal jurisdiction principles when adapting the Rome Statutes to their own regulations, such as Korea, Uruguay, Panama, Burkina Faso, Comoros, and many other states, in fact. There are some processes that are based on the principle of jurisdiction. Ella today they told me that my beard was a bit upsetting because of the microphone, but there is no solution, I'm afraid, to that. This said, I would like to say that there are legal processes that are based on the principle of universal jurisdiction in southern states, such as in South Africa where there are two legal situations about crimes in Zimbabwe and Madagascar, and also another one in Argentina. And probably in the near future we will find similar claims in other states. This said, there are a few things that I would like to say, especially with my colleagues from the civil society and human rights associations. Well, from the very beginning, uh, I was shocked by, by this enforcement of international courts. And from the very beginning, well, I think, my organization thinks that international courts, what they enforce, which is legal jurisdiction over individuals, they do not have uh, a genuine universal jurisdiction. If you check the Rome Institutes and you check the court for former Yugoslavia, for Granta, for Libya or Sierra Leone, they all exercise their own competence mainly based on the principle of territoriality. The International Criminal Court has competence over crimes committed in territories and state parts, um, and member, state members, sorry, or by nationals. That's the principle of active personality. In Yugoslavia, for example, they give power to this court for crimes committed in the territory of former Yugoslavia from 1991 onwards, and the same goes for other international cases. <coughs> but from jurisprudence, from these international courts, there are some decisions that help promote universal jurisdiction in general. First of all, there is this paragraph in the preamble of uh, the Roman Statute, which is paragraph number six, saying, recalling that all states are under the obligation to enforce criminal jurisdiction for international crimes. CPI does not, sorry, ICC does not have that jurisdiction, but reminds all states that they do have the jurisdiction, so they remind them of their obligation to enforce the law for crimes committed in the territory or by their nationals or where the nationals are victims, suppressing all adjectives, which means that the Rome Institute entails this support for universal jurisdiction by local courts. Then, something else I would like to highlight on the case law that I find very interesting, especially for non-governmental organizations, we really need to draw on it. There is a resolution by the court for former Yugoslavia on the case on inferency, huh? And there are some three, four paragraphs that are very convenient to our topic of universal jurisdiction. In the first level court, they said that prohibition on torture, it had become just cogent, which means that was preliminary norm for human rights. So it was compulsory. States cannot allow torture. And then, 
it also reminds what the consequences are because if it is a Jews conscience prohibition on torture, which means that pardons cannot be issued in this case, and also that universal jurisdiction needs to be enforced by all states regarding this type of crime. In a quite recent ruling by the International Criminal Court for the case Belgium against Senegal, the court has expressly said that the prohibition on torture is not just a common law standard, but it is also a year's cogent standard. A few minutes ago, Helen mentioned how one of the main problems that we find in some states is prosecuting international crime, international crimes or international law crimes based on the definition of ordinary crimes, which, as you know, tend to be subject to prescription or amnesties or immunity. According to this ruling, this preliminary ruling for Lebanon, and it was chaired by Professor Kassese, according to which the tribunal explains there is no problem, there's no inconvenient, according to international law, that there is a posterior law, a law coming afterwards, and still criminalizes those behaviors according to criminal law, and so that the they can be prosecuted in local courts based on the concept of criminal law, even though it had not been criminalized originally in domestic law. But the only condition there in order to have them indicted is that such behavior, which is not criminalized as an international crime, had to be already been defined as a crime against international law by international community. A second comment that I would like to share here, and I extend that to all the judges in the audience, and I find it is just appropriate for the situation in Spain, and that has to do with hierarchy in international law and national law, uh, domestic law. Spain, as other states, it's a party state to the Vienna Convention on rights and other treaties. This is a convention from 69, which I think it's a prototype, it is a role model of a treaty where common law is coded into their standards and regulations. And there are two regulations I would like to highlight here. Article 26 of Vienna Convention says all treaty in force is compulsory for all parties and it has to be enforced in good faith. So compulsory and good faith. And then Article 26, which is uh, an addition, adds one party cannot invoke the, the clauses or the provisions of domestic law as uh, considered in breach with the domestic law, which means that international law is based on the higher level of international law compared to domestic law in each state, which means no state can use a domestic law prevailing over international law, even if it is in its own constitution or other law, again, take into account a provision in international law, which is a, a, a message uh, that the civil society organizations in Spain should be using and remind them to the Spanish lawmakers, especially those judges, that have it in their power to t take a choice, to take a ruling, and decide whether the decisions are in accordance with the Constitution or not. And remind them that they have the powers to take apart those decisions that had been entered into or those provisions entered into by Spain in international law. What I say about Spain can be used for any other states, all those states cannot forget about the obligations they entered into according to international law. There's a second, maybe third reflection, which I would also like to share here with you, especially with civil society. That's the difference in international law between what we call universal jurisdiction and 
the obligation to prosecute or extradite, known as Audedere Audiudicare, that's the other name. These are two international law standards or provisions which are different but somehow are joined together. You know that in universal jurisdiction, Geneva's uh, conventions are usually called upon. Each of the parties will have to prosecute those accused of inciting or perpetrating any of these serious actions, and they'll have to bring them to trial regardless of their nationality. The obligation of all four Geneva Conventions on States, which is a common law, by the way, it's the obligation to enforce their universal jurisdiction regarding serious breaches, which is an undercategorious part of war crimes, and those are the most serious war crimes. All states, all states are to enforce universal jurisdiction in case of of these crimes. This audiudere adjudicare principle, it's a bit different, as I said, because it's a um, provision according to which within the territory we find the suspect of uh, criminal accountability of a given crime. States are first to enforce their own local jurisdiction or, if not, extradite this person to a third party state or finally leave it with a, an international court that has jurisdiction. For example, Convention Against Torture or on Enforced Disappearances or on Hostage Taking and many others. Why do I mention these uh, two principles, which is universal jurisdiction and your debtor? Why do I say they have something in common? Well, because this Ayutthaya uh, principle entails the enforcement of universal jurisdiction, and this principle is, well, if we find a foreigner in our territory that has committed torture or enforced disappearances in another country against the citizens of the country, if the state is obliged to enforce its jurisdiction, it has to do so on the basis of universal jurisdiction principles. For example, Kalet Nesar in Switzerland, which is a legal situation led by trial, an expert organization seated in, in, sit in Geneva. It's a uh, wonderful NGO. And this is a very good example of universal jurisdiction. The Committee Against Torture, on a case called Suriman Gengen, said back then that it was not necessary at all to have a period of extradition for the state to be forced not to grant extradition and so to enforce its own jurisdiction. And this has also been said by the ICC in a case that I mentioned before and that it is Belgian against Senegal. Literally, the ICC said, sorry, the, the International Court of Justice said that there can be no, there's no need for an extradition request preventing them from enforcing universal jurisdiction. Even more important, International Court of Justice said that the terms and the Convention Against Torture, because uh, that's what this was about in Belgium, it's Senegal, and which can also be used in Convention Against Torture, means actually that the state is to bring to trial the suspect of criminal accountability before mm, domestic courts. That's the true obligation. And extradition is just an option. It's an option that the state is given. And I highlight this case law, I highlight this because I guess civil society needs to take this into account when sending a request to Spain or any other country and remind them what the obligations are according to international law. And that needs to be respected as a higher hierarchy over prevailing over any other domestic law. There's something else which I also find important, and I think it's worth mentioning. And there's something that Helen said, and I did not really understand about subsidiarity. She mentioned interstate subsidiarity or subsidiarity between states and international courts, uh, criminal courts. 
Well, it's always been important for my organization and that it's to pray, to pray and, and to give an example. And we are talking about the competition of jurisdictions over international crimes. There's nothing, absolutely nothing in international law that gives me any preference to the territorial state or to the state where the nationals are to be found, the, the, the national countries are to be found, compared to international law. If we're talking about genocide, if you're talking about war crimes, all states, all states have the same rights to exercise their own jurisdiction, the criminal jurisdiction. That's a remark to Article Number 8 in the draft for crimes against humanity drafted by the court in 96. And there is an explicit paragraph by Goldstone, and that was the report sent by the Research Commission after the conflict between Palestine and Israel 2009-2010. And there's this other braver report, which is more or less contemporary, produced by the European Union and African Union on the principle of universal jurisdiction, where it sets out all the provisions. And I think the organizers of this event should keep this in mind when adopting or enacting the principles that will be read at the end of the conference. I always remember, I recall actually the words of Chris Ben Hall, who unfortunately died over a year ago, and he was a master in legal uh, and universal jurisdiction for most of us. And he used to say, the fact that the culprit of international crimes arrested in a third party state, the fact that they are found in a third party state, shows that the territorial state had not been diligent enough. So there was some kind of superstition against the territorial state in the enforcement of their own of its own jurisdiction they, because they had not done things as they should have when looking into this crime, international crime. As for international law crimes, I think we need to discuss competition instead of subsidiarity. What does it mean? How, how much time? How much time do I have left? Well, that's why I've observed in concern the declarations, the uh, statements by my country in a debate in the UN about the scope and enforcement of the principle of universal jurisdiction when they said, uh, always taking account my, um, my organization's perspective, and I think it was unfortunately the primary responsibility to prosecute and investigate belongs to those states where the crimes have been committed or to other states that might have some kind of connection to those crimes, such as the case of those states where the perpetrator comes from or the nationality of the perpetrator or nationality of the victim, which I think it's wrong when talking about international law crimes, uh, talking about preference or subsidiarity is not what should we should be discussing, but we are talking about the competition of all, uh, all jurisdictions. And finally, I would like to use a couple of minutes. Uh, this is a remark, it's not a reflection anymore, but a remark where I think, or my organization thinks that we are headed for universal jurisdiction. Well, before the sixth committee of the United Nations, where four, five, for four or five years now we have a daily discussion, which is for the interpretation of the universal jurisdiction principle. And there is this debate amongst all the European states that are in favor of universal jurisdiction, and also the non-aligned movement that has opposed it. And the International Law Commission and the Second Forum which is important, and there are two, three basic uh, debates there for the future universal jurisdiction. So, this committee is tr looking into the immunity of public offices. It is led by Confeccion Escobar, a well-known Spanish professor, where she tends to meet with the committee and to discuss their concerns. 
Then there is another thing that needs to be discussed is the eventual need for a convention on crimes against humanity that will be done at the Commission on International Law. And finally, the debate, which I think it's not getting anywhere, on the principle of out there out judicare. It has been conducted at the Commission and which unfortunately has not been concluded and has not convinced all the members on the existence of, of provisions on common law regarding these facts. Well, these were my comments, the remarks that I brought with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> Ask this very complicated question. As for the special court for Lebanon on the principle of the lawfulness, what about enforced disappearances and its permanent nature or continuous nature? Is that trade only applicable after the crime has been identified by the international community? Well, it's been discussed already. Uh, you can take it if you want, but this has been discussed already, so this problem of whether it is retroactive or not, nomen juris, which is known, or uh, if, it, if the... All right, okay. Question about the enforced disappearance of people. It is also applicable to other crimes under international law. Well, the Convention on Forced, Enforced Disappearance of People does not lead to a new crime in the under international law. It is a declaration. It is declaration. So it writes down, it codes something that existed in reality. And actually, in the study on the Nuremberg Tribunal, occurred in the last part at the end of Article 6C. St sets out the uh, this enforcement dis disappearance. So the tribunal for the case of Lebanon, I've also read some jurisprudence from the European court. I cannot remember it literally or the case, I cannot remember which case it was, but it says that there is no problems for a further norm to codify that behavior, as long as the behavior or the activity or the act committed in the past was already considered or recognized under international law as a crime or as a criminal act. In my country, there was a forced disappearance in 75 or 76. According to the perspective of international law, there would be no problem whatsoever to prosecute that enforced disappearance because, well, what came afterwards was a norm, a coding, a coding of that act as a, uh, as a criminal act.